So our panel members today are Jim Benford, uh, microwave sciences. Sci sciences. sciences, yes. Jim Cordes from Cornell, Andrew Howard from the University of Hawaii, Andrew Simeon from Breakthrough Listen UC Berkeley, and Dan Wertheimer as well, Breakthrough Listen UC Berkeley. Their bios are in your program. And I'm going to start because Jim is giving a talk in a session tomorrow, but when you look at his title, you're going to ask yourself, why wasn't he in the session this morning? Good question. Right. And so why should you have been in that session this morning? And how do we broaden the question of the detectability of directed energy launch systems? Uh, it, it's all as a conspiracy so that I can speak twice. <laughs> um, I'm going to quickly give you a survey of directed energy propulsion as it pertains to as SETI observable. The first slide shows you the entirety of space propulsion laid out as a function of the velocity relative to light. And I'm going to talk only about the two facts. The, the first is if you really want to get to high velocities, you're going to have to use beam-driven sails or interstellar ramjets, which is found out to be uh, is really impractical in several ways, which I can elaborate on. Everything else is really too slow. Uh, if you look at the, as my son and I have done, at all of the quantified uh, directed energy propulsion papers of the last several decades, you get the following parameter space. This is power in the uh, vertical and duration in the horizontal axis. Uh, the domains shown are various types of missions. In the bottom left, you see uh, 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 launching into orbit from a surface. Uh, next is uh, orbit raising from that orbit to higher orbits, then interplanetary and flying interstellar. And the, 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 the indi these uh, triangles and dots refer to various mission concepts and, uh, uh, that have been, occurred in the literature and we have quantified. The, uh, uh, notice that uh, there are, the diagonal lines are of constant energy and that uh, you generally go up in energy as you go to more and more ambitious missions. Now, if you uh, uh, compare this to what we think of, here's, here are Starshot, the recent proposal, the Arecibo radio telescope at a megawatt, and uh, uh, various beacons quantified by my brother and my son and myself, some years ago, which are cost optimized and therefore much more likely to be built by our kind of civilization uh, on economic grounds. You'll notice that most of the, uh, uh, the uh, missions shown here, or the applications shown here, require higher powers and longer durations than the, the three uh, that I just described. So that means that they're going to be highly more observable than uh, interstellar beacons or of anything we have generated to date, including planetary radars. So the point is that they're going to be so much more observable, that's what we ought to be looking for. Now, they come with a downside. Although some of them are long in duration, uh, others are quite short because the mission is short, like launch to orbit is a few minutes. Uh, and they also would be seen only on a transient basis as that uh, application was needed, but that might be a series of such launches, say over a 12-hour period until the uh, planetary alignments are different. Uh, and you'll hear from John Goulichant about this tomorrow afternoon. Uh, the uh, other applications uh, run to uh, uh, higher slew rates because you're, tr you're moving, you're following the directed energy uh, beam, the direct energy beams following the spacecraft as it accelerates it. And so you've got a limited amount of time you can really look at it, uh, the, or the, you could really see it, actually. Uh, when you get up to the interstellar, which is really terribly ambitious, uh, you know, uh, then you tend to uh, not have any slew rate at all because it's not pointed at, at you if you're the target, and it, it, it tends to be unwavering and not, and not slewing. Uh, Starshot, you'll notice, ha requires less power in a shorter duration because it's a, a much, much smaller mass, gram scale uh, spacecraft, and therefore uh, just doesn't need as much energy. And that was part of the purpose of this design point. 
So, I think that's it, and we go to you. Thank you very much, Jim. I've got a question for you that I will follow up with when we get finished with all of the panelists. Okay, uh, am, am I live here? Yes. yes. Um, I wanted to introduce uh, some radio astronomy and uh, some of the signals that we are um, currently probing that are very interesting, uh, perhaps even from a SETI point of view. Uh, but one thing that wasn't, uh, has not really been mentioned today is what N is. There was a, st a statement of N equals one, I think by, by Phil, and uh, so the so for nearby, uh, nearby civilizations, it's implicit that N is large in the galaxy. Uh, it may not be, and so I think we need to hedge our bets, and if we're hedging our bets, that means we do need to worry about um, extinction in the optical. Uh, in the radio, we have propagation effects. Uh, they were sort of mentioned um, as a pejorative earlier today, um, whereas actually in the, the radio business, we use those propagation effects as reality checks on um, whether a signal is really astrophysical or not. Uh, so we don't, you know, they are a bit of a hindrance in a signal to noise point of view, but not really from an identification point of view. I'm showing here real quickly the three, three kinds of propagation effects um, that come into play. Um, dispersion that's been mentioned. We also have multi-path, which produces those asymmetric pulses that you see. We also have uh, constructive interference and, and destructive interference from the multi-path. Uh, so I wanted to show this slide because in the top panel is basically, an, it, people call this sometimes an interstellar hologram. It's basically the coherent radiation from a pulsar interfering with itself, um, and this is measured in time and frequency. You can think of it as a diffraction pattern that's wavelength dependent and the Earth is sweeping through it uh, across time. So those, uh, the intensity modulations described here are 100%. Uh, those will affect any SETI signal, they affect pulsar signals, they affect burst signals. So I just quickly wanted to then mention um, about fast radio bursts. This is a very hot topic. Um, there are now 17 of them that have been identified, 17 different sources, different directions on the sky. Uh, one of them has been shown to repeat. Uh, we still don't, do not know what these things are. Uh, until about six months ago, uh, people were talking about uh, ideas ranging from just outside the solar system, or actually even in the solar system, even terrestrial, uh, going out to cosmological. Uh, there are still some differences of opinions, but I would say the consensus is trending towards these being extragalactic, but not necessarily cosmological. Uh, rate the fa so I'm showing here uh, on the, the right-hand side, you can see a, 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 f a frequency time uh, plot for one of these bursts, and it has a very weird spectrum, and the spectrum from burst to burst for this repeating source, uh, the spectrum jumps around, and it's very unlike anything else we've seen. So people have naturally asked, you know, the first question you get from some people is, well, is this ET or not? Uh, that's very similar to the pulsar question, uh, the same question that was asked about pulsars in 1968 uh, when they were um, uh, discovered. So what I'll just say then is that I think the FRB uh, analysis that's really playing out as we speak uh, and you know, trying to understand what they are, uh, I think is a good template for uh, any kind of SETI, be it in the optical or the infrared or wherever. That's it. Oh, thank you very much, Jim. Um, Andrew Howard, what's, what's on your mind? Um, you, you got your degree from Paul uh, doing SETI, doing uh, the construction of a telescope and the fancy electronics and chips that were needed to do it. Um, and now you've gone back more to the traditional uh, astronomy, exoplanet world. What are we missing? Are we missing anything? Is there something you'd like to add as a thought? So I don't have any slides prepared, but I wanted to make one kind of reactive statement, and this will be a little bit provocative. Um, and this is, uh, there's sort of this new, newish idea of extragalactic optical SETI, and this is in large part through the, the um, the, the idea of sails, laser-powered sails. And I'd like to challenge this a little bit um, and kind of go back 
to the basic assumptions about why optical study is a good idea to begin with, the, the kind of fundamental, fundamental reason why optical study gained in popularity was, of course, because of the enormous um, uh, gain of optical telescopes. The Keck telescope uh, at one micron has a gain of about a part in 10 to the 15. So uh, that's the energy gain factor over an isotropic transmitter. And so optical SETI makes sense for targeted communication because a transmitter can save by that factor when beaming radiation directly at us. But the point is they have to know that they're beaming at us. And so if you are at extra galactic distances, it's hard to know, basically you can't know that you're aiming at any one uh, target. So you lose this gain factor. So I'd like to challenge my panelists now and then I guess the audience later, what, what is it that makes extragalactic study possible when essentially you're doing an isotropic transmission beamed narrowly in some region of space and then effectively scanning it all over the place? And the chance that any one spot in the sky is hit if for a transmitter that let's say is on all the time and is scanning around the sky, the, the random spot in the sky is effectively targeted one over the gain factor of time. So help me understand this. All right. Andrew Simeon, do you want to help Andrew Howard understand, or do you have another topic you'd like to introduce? No, he was talking about um, Chris Rose's factors. Extraterrestrial technology, and I think what we heard from, from Phil today and, and from the Breakthrough Starshot announcement um, on Tuesday is, is that as human beings, we're on the precipice of developing a, a new technology that is um, you know, potentially very much observable uh, from, a, from a SETI standpoint. And, um, and that's a, a very exciting thing. And I think as, as SETI scientists, we should, we should take note of, of technological developments that happen on our own planet um, that would uh, potentially produce a, an uh, observable signature. Uh, I, I guess another thing is, is that just you know, more broadly, SETI and, and astronomy in general is a, is a game of exploring parameter space. We want to explore. Uh, as, as much of that parameter space as we can for as many different types of signals, different wavelengths, uh, different, different time scales. And it, it seems that the, the breakthrough star shot and directed energy idea is pushing us into new parameter space. Uh, and that's, um, that's, that's very exciting in and of itself. Um, and, then, and then lastly, I think kind of touching on what, what Jim brought up, um, we should keep in mind that there are a lot of astrophysical searches for transients, both in the optical and, and in the radio. And we should keep in mind sort of what, what implications those searches might have for the kind of, kind of signals that we're talking about. I think that's a great topic for this continued discussion. That's what we're here for. Dan, um, you brought some toys. Um, yeah, so I have a, a few reactions to things that happened this morning. Um, we, we talked a lot about these uh, new exciting uh, ideas for looking at the whole sky all the time in the optical or maybe the infrared. I think that's spectacular. You can maybe find these very low duty cycle signals if they're out there. There's an analog to that in the radio that Ron Eakers has been thinking about of placing uh, phased array feeds on the ground and forming uh, 400 or 1,000 beams. Uh, and I think that would be also a very exciting experiment to look for low duty cycle, um, low duty cycle um, radio signals as well. Um, my, my personal philosophy is we don't know what to look for, so we should try a lot of different things inexpensively and have experiments that last a year or two and then try something new. Moore's Law is changing very fast. And so you, wanna, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, and you want to try a lot of different signal types and frequencies and ideas and duty cycles and do a lot of different things in SETI. Um, so um, other thing that happened this morning is some, a, a few people suggested that we should see the universe or send messages. I think, as you know, that's, that's quite controversial. Um, my personal feeling is that we're an emerging civilization. We've had radio 100 years. We should wait 1,000 years or so. We should listen 
uh, at first and learn what's out there. We don't know what the risks are. Some people say there's zero risk. Some pe people, Stephen Hawking says they're going to come and eat us. I don't know what the risks are. I think it's very uncertain. But even if, if you think the risks are, I don't know, 10 to the minus 4, that's, that's an experiment that kills 100,000 people, right? 10, 10, 10 billion people on the planet times 10 to the minus 4. So I, I don't know how you assess those risks. And I, I think we need to listen at first uh, and learn what's out there and, and think carefully before we put, put earthlings at risk. Um, the uh, other people said that uh, radio came before optical. I'm not sure that that's strictly true. Uh, the early SETI ideas 200 years ago were optical SETI experiments. The, uh, the ideas that uh, Charles Crow suggested we use mirrors to reflect sunlight to the Martians and um, Gauss suggested building a big right triangle three, four, five miles on a side and there were kerosenes with rings of fire 20 miles across. Those are all optical city experiments. Radio came 100 years after those. Um, the, the, they, were, they were kind of Gedunken thought experiments. There was no Yuri Milner, there was no Pete Warden to fund those things. Um, so, but they did, 100 years later, I think the first SETI experiments, Marconi, Tesla, the Navy, eventually Frank Drake. Um, so I, anyway, I think we're just beginning to explore the SETI parameter space. Maybe we've covered a billionth of the parameter space so far. Um, I'm optimistic in the long run because of this incredible exponential growth. Um, so I think we should be doing a lot of these orthogonal, inexper inexpensive experiments and explore corners of the parameter space. Um, Jamie asked for a little show and tell, and I, uh, I wanted to bring something that we did in the late 90s, which I think was the first uh, optical SETI experiment to look for pulses. And it was a very simple thing, it just kind of parts from my basement uh, that we threw together in a few weeks and uh, the light comes in here and it went to a couple of photomultiplier tubes that we had and a little coincidence detector. Um, it was the kind of the early ideas to see what the backgrounds, it actually didn't work very well but it got us started and Andrew uh, Simeon made it much better and uh, Shelley Wright worked on it with and it now um, and then Andrew Howard and Paul Horowitz did, and now the stuff is uh, you know a billion times better than but this was kind of the early days, so it's kind of a fun little thing if you want to take a look at it. A trip down memory lane. Fantastic. Okay, um, before we start going into this, uh, it, it maybe a little bit more aggressively, I was asked by the organizers to take a poll. So Jamie and James, are you ready to count? Right. I was asked to ask the audience, uh, well, you can, yes, you have hands, raise them. Um, so who in the audience um, thinks that there's life beyond Earth? Uh, let's ask the negative that's easier to count. <laughs> is anyone convinced that life is singular to this planet? Joe, you're talking about primitive life. <laughs> think, all right. Does anybody think that we're unique. Life on this planet is unique. Any, life, right? Any, Any primitive life. life? I didn't put the intelligent qualifier yet. Life. Raise your hand. What about people that don't know? Well, okay. All right. And and you th are, and and Phil and actually in the back too. I'm sorry. I didn't understand your question. I'm trying to say, I'm trying to ask the question about whether life resulting from physics and chemistry as we understand it is a unique incidence here or does it happen elsewhere? I'm, I'm conducting a poll at the request of the organizers. All right, so now we have a few a few that say that it is possible that we are unique, and that's what the, um, when you speak to people in the public, they do not understand that we actually, as scientists who are interested in the answer to this question, who are working to find perhaps an answer to this question, can also entertain that from our uh, current state of knowledge, the answer could be that we are unique. And it's, it's, it's something that the scientific um, community can hold these 
different concepts in their mind simultaneously, and it's really hard for people that I talk to anyway. All right, now let's ask that question. Um, if I say not life, but intelligent life, and I qualify that by the fact that technology is our proxy for intelligence. So how many think that there's technological life beyond the earth, beyond the earth? That's why. <laughs> Thank you. That's why I didn't go into polling as a profession. All right. Um, I actually thought it might be about half and a half. What about the opposite? That there is no technological life beyond Earth. All right. I'd say less than a dozen in your poll. All right. Of those that think that there is technological life beyond Earth, do you want to give me a probability? Is it greater than 50%? I asked the, that, thank you, that's, that's correct. I asked the, the uh, verb as the present tense for both questions, so. <laughs> All right, does anybody, is anybody very confident? So greater than 50%. Yes. Greater than 50%. Jamie, you have to count that. I, you got it? All right, you think it's there, but for whatever reason, uh, you're not so confident. So less than 50% chance. All right, so more people think that it exists that are willing to put a percentage on their thing. Did I, are we done? <laughs> are we done? Thank you. Okay, so now, to the nitty gritty, um, and I don't know what you're gonna do with that information, but you got it for what it's worth. Um, so Jim, you showed us a graph of various types of missions and requirements. They were all ground-based, right? The launches? Oh, no, 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 no. Some were ground-based. Actually, most were space-based. Um, uh, 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 generally, most of the director energy concepts for propulsion uh, are consider uh, things like uh, launching from Earth orbit to interplanetary, or from something like a Lagrange point into deep space in the outer solar system, uh, and that's because of the problems of launching from Earth, which are everything from weather to rotation to gravity. All right, so I was gonna go in one direction with respect to <clears throat> this, but let me, what, what kinds of considerations are there for what's the optimal frequency for doing these launches? Everybody asks that question. It's a really popular question. Everybody says to me, you know, the first time I talked to uh, uh, Yuri Milner, uh, he said, what do you think the right frequency is? <laughs> I said, I think that's the wrong question. The right, right question is, what frequencies do we need in order to do the research to figure out the right answer? Because that's where we are right now. You see, we, we don't have to guess the final answer because I can tell you one thing about Starshot. As a member of that team, what we end up with will not be what we're thinking of now. Otherwise, we're, we're godlike powers. <laughs> but in fact, research tells you the right answer. And the right question is, what uh, types of apparatus and frequencies do we need to prove, to, to ask the questions, to do the experiments, and get the right answers, and then imagine the right system? So I'm not uh, an advocate of the microwave or the millimeter wave or the lasers, and all, those, all those, those concepts I showed you, those 20 concepts out of the literature, involve all of those frequencies for frequencies all the way from two and a half gigahertz to a micron wavelengths, and I think that's fine. Well, it, this, it let a thousand flowers bloom. We need to investigate all the technological approaches, but the real questions are things like, will the sail stay on the beam? Can it suffer on this level of acceleration? Do we know how to communicate with it? Do we know how to get the data back? 
those are the questions that will determine what the system will look like, not the frequency. Okay, so both you and Dan have used the let a thousand flowers bloom idea. I wanna, I wanna push back a bit uh, with respect to the fact that uh, it seems to me that no hypotheses, no results from some experiment or hypothesis are really more valuable if they're significant. This, and if you're, how do you uh, adequately explore a particular concept if you're not willing to commit to an amount of effort that is commensurate with trying to end up with a significant, either a positive or a significant no? I, I like short questions. <laughs> uh, so let's see. Uh, a, a good experiment is a well-framed question. Identify the questions as uh, Pete Warden's uh, team has done, and there's quite a list, it goes to seven pages, the, uh, and attack those questions systematically to eliminate the unknowns and to pin down the answers. Uh, and you have to do that with the available means at hand. That determines uh, what you do. Do I answer your question? Well, if, you've if, answered it, I think, very, it, quite, adequately for the how do we develop the technologies to, to take on these new challenges. I don't think you've answered it with respect to Dan, who has said, oh, let's, let's do this and let's do that and let's do the other thing. It's a great idea. Let's try it. And how long do you try it? When do you decide to stop? I, I think from a, from a steady standpoint, Jill, I think there's room for both of these. I mean, I think you, you needn't have only large programs or only small programs. I think to kind of borrow from Avi's idea from this morning, I mean, you want a, a, a landscape of different things. And certainly, if you want to, to have a very meaningful null hypothesis, you need to look at a lot of stars. You need to look at a lot of bandwidth. You need to go very deeply. But I think you also want to have programs that allow you to develop the, the new technologies and the new ideas that are going to lead to the to the next experiment 10 years or 20 years down the road. Correct, so we now develop them, then how do we decide how long we're going to use those? And do we do it in addition to what we were doing? Is it always an additive uh, program? Or Avi showed us a path that went into the junk bonds, right, and went into the trash. And when, what kinds of uh, landmarks or signs do you use to judge when, you know, this really isn't going to work out. It's time to, to jump ship. I, I think it's a good question. I mean, you know, we don't talk about this a lot in, in SETI. The, the microwave hypothesis has been with us for, for some time. We certainly have a, a lot of, of parameter space left to explore. We need telescopes that can see a, a lot more of the sky instantaneously, and, and Dan mentioned what Ron's talked about, and aperture arrays will get us there. I, I mean, I don't, I don't see it sort of in, in 20 or 30 years, but maybe in, in 40 or 50, we will be at a point where we look at everything that's been done, and we say, well, maybe we should, we should try something else. Yeah, anybody else on the panel? So, Jill, it seems like um, if you take one of the approaches, I mean, there are multiple reasons why we might not detect something. Maybe there's no technology, but let's suppose there is, and we go for 50 years without a detection. I think what we would have to do is uh, look at every star in the galaxy, if we're talking about the galaxy, before we could really conclude something. Because implicit is that n is small, and is it one or two, and we're one of those? <laughs> you know, if so, then the other one may be on the other side of the galaxy. So for completeness, to, you know, to really be able to confidently say something in the small n regime, I think we needed full galactic census. Okay. So then... Um, Avi had some suggestions for how uh, resources get allocated, all right? So now, uh, do you require that you take all the technologies and techniques and, and ideas that we've come up with and run them all exhaustively till you get a full galactic search? Or do you say, this one's going bad faster or has reach limitations that we can't expend. I mean, how do you decide, how do you prioritize? I, we all wish that we had this abundance of riches and we were all doing lots of different things, but it's hard to um, so Jill, I, that. My kind of, the reason that I think we should do a lot of different things is because I think it'd be naive for us to think that we know what the right strategy is given our history every 10 years we have some 
completely different idea. You know, we used to think that smoke signals and mirrors, and now that's, we laugh at that. And so my guess is 200 years from now, we'll be completely laughing at what we're doing now. But so I think if there's some new idea that has promise, we need to try that. And I, I think, I don't know what the right level of experiment, but I think if I had an X amount of money, I would spread it out logarithmically. I do a couple of big projects, 10 medium projects and a hundred little projects and encourage a lot of new students and new ideas at a lot of different institutions. Um, you know, there's a big problem in SETI right now that there are very few young people. Uh, and and uh, so, so, I, uh, so I, 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 would, I think you gotta do things at a lot of different scales and be careful about putting all your money into one basket. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me offer one other perspective. The, the question you asked is essentially when do you hit diminishing returns yes. in the sense of a, another dollar invested does not give you a significant improvement in your search sensitivity or your overall survey completeness. And I think the way to approach that is to imagine a model universe that has some set of transmitters in it, that those transmitters have a certain set of properties. And then our job as SETI scientists is to go out and try to find those transmitters or to falsify that hypothesis. And when we can imagine a model universe that we, is plausible under certain scenarios, um, and we can falsify that, then perhaps that's the time to move on. So to give, an, to give one example, suppose we're looking uh, at op an optical SETI, say uh, visible band. Mm -hmm. If we posit a model universe that has some average separation between transmitters, and we can constrain by observations that average separation between transmitters to be greater than, say, the extinction length scale, then maybe optical study isn't the right approach and we need to move on. So I think we need to look for sort of natural boundaries uh, to these searches. Okay. Jim, you wanted to make uh, a One of SETI's problems is that uh, to be, well, science is something that's falsifiable. It's hard to falsify SETI, uh, uh, you're, you were saying, basically. Um, in fact, I think the, uh, several hypotheses have been falsified in SETI. Uh, Bracewell's galactic club isn't there. The early uh, SETI investigators, as Frank Drake was telling me just uh, recently, uh, really thought that they were going to find something in five years, ten years. Well, that was half a century ago. So that, there are things that have been falsified, and in fact, I have a talk I give about the various aspects of SETI that have been falsified in the past, but we don't tend to look upon that, in that from that point of view, and I think we should. We should say, is, if it's gonna be a science, we have to make propositions that can be falsified, at least in principle. Well, I think I actually refer to this as an exploratory science, as opposed to just pure science. Um, Dan, uh, going back to something you said, which I think is, is you know, very, important, which is that the technological capabilities that we have at any one moment uh, change and are changing quite radically. Some of the technologies still remain a good idea, but um, it's those zeta rays out there that, that we may actually not have figured out what they are or uh, that that's the right communication scheme. So. Uh, for everyone, our strategy should be to try and help the world to stick around long enough so that we can figure out that technology and get on with the project. And I think that's actually one of the things that's so fabulous about SETI is the international capabilities uh, and, and, and opportunities and the fact that when we talk to people about SETI, uh, it is literally holding up a mirror to them to everyone on the planet that encourages them to see themselves in a different perspective, to show them that relative to something out there, we're all the same, and let's get on with solving our problems and forget about the national boundaries here. So I like that about SETI, that it is something that is, uh, has the potential for helping us to find a way to a long future. Okay, um, rather than auger in here, let me go back to Jim. Um, Avi has been vocal, Dan and I have suggested, you know, why aren't these FRBs LGMs? Can we prove it? Can we disprove 
that they are? At this stage, I would say no, uh, because there's all, there are always some loopholes, right? But what we know about the spectrum, the spect as I was saying quickly, the spectra are, are strange um, for these FRBs. So the, at least for the one that shows repeats. So the repeater, we have found 17 pulses from the same object. They have the same dispersion measure, so it's not evolving. That puts some constraints on models. But the spectra don't look like anything else that we've seen astrophysically. Um, some of them decline in frequency. One that happened then a minute later was rising with frequency. <coughs> Uh, we've seen these things at fairly well separated bands, 1.5 gigahertz and, and 2 gigahertz. Uh, so, you know, it could be astrophysically, it could be a, a relatively narrow band signal, meaning maybe say 300 megahertz wide. So it's not exactly narrow band, but it's not your classic power law. And it's sloshing around in frequency. Um, that, uh, you know, we can think of cyclotron uh, type models mm -hmm. for that perhaps but maybe it's some weird um, ET thing. It, it seems, if, if so, it would be highly inefficient, I think, because it's, it's a lot of energy. Okay. Um, so it's just like the Pulsar story, um, except in, with the Pulsar story 50 years ago or so, uh, it, you know, it was the power argument was used, but then it was identification of them. Um, and that's the, the holy grail right now, and hopefully not off in the distant future, but like, maybe real soon, is localizing one of them and finding a, a counterpart. Okay. So, so there is a road map, um, and you know, it's a short road, I think. Okay. So on, on FRBs, yeah. so I'll, just, I'll just add, it's, it's certainly um, you know, intriguing to imagine that, that this might be related to ETI, but it seems awfully hard to get around the fact that these things are coming from a lot of different directions on the sky, aside from the, the repeating source that, that Jim mentioned. So, seems there would have to be some conspiring of, of ETIs in many parts of the galaxy. It's just large N. So, or, or, large or N, or can I recall a pretty good science fiction movie from about 20 years ago, which had a transportation system, which opened and closed, and yeah. might have had some millisecond uh, emission. emission. Right. Hey, we don't, we've never had a sequel to Contact, although it was I set up to have one. So I think so. There wasn't a all, these, to uh, all of these new objects that when they get discovered, you know, we should immediately think about this. I think each one of them has a one in a million chance of being ET. When pulsars were discovered, it had a one in a million. FRBs, one in a million. And then the recent WTF star with highly variability, one in a million. But, you know, if we keep looking at them a million times, then maybe one of them will turn out to be ET. I, I don't think that, um, so I'm not saying we shouldn't pursue that idea, it's just that each one of them has, but uh, the, the reason that I'm sort of thinking FRB, if ETs trying to be heard, they would not make their signal look like it's a natural signal that changes with frequency exactly the way that the interstellar medium, you know, does that quadratic change in frequency with time. Uh, it, it makes, it, 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 if they're deliberately trying to hide their signal, maybe they would do that, but it looks so like natural phenomena because, you know, if, if they wanted to call our attention, then it would be easy to make it s different from what the interstellar medium does. Well, so I would actually you counter you on that, Dan. ET shoes. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I, I stepped over Look, you, Andrew. Oh, no, I, just, I was just say, telling Dan that he's violating his own principle of putting himself inside ah, ET's yeah. mind a little <laughs> bit too much. Well, He's okay. saying it's an anthropocentric. Yeah, I was gonna challenge yeah. you, Dan. Uh, we're an emerging technology. Yeah. We're starting to, um, observe our universe. If I were an ET, I might make a signal yeah. that would in fact get caught by exactly the right. filters that you're building, and it would be a graduate student then going through a database of many examples of these signals right. that would find what really sets it apart. So as, as you know, Jill, that a lot of really exciting discoveries in astronomy are made serendipitously, like the pulsar discovery. Jocelyn Bell was not looking for pulsars, and and uh, ET could easily fall into that class. And, and I think that leads us to, it might not be one of us here on the panel or the talks we heard today, it'll be somebody looking at dark matter, or um, I don't know, gravity waves, or something that we hadn't thought of in the SETI community. And we should be looking in these databases and glitches in databases. I'm, I think data mining searches are quite interesting. Yeah, I agree, and we heard the, the beginnings of, of 
potential for that today. Okay, so um, Andrew, we've, we've had, Andrew Howard, so we've had discussion today about transient phenomena. And it seems to me that your, well, the Harvard uh, sky survey running now for a number of years, looking at the sky multiple times, you can, what can you say about the natural transient background with nanosecond timescale variations in the optical? I mean, I remember, I remember Phil Morrison, before you ever turned on the first search, he said, what's your background gonna be? What are you gonna find? And we don't seem to have found a background. In terms of interstellar, I, don't, I agree. I think for nanosecond timescale pulses, we just haven't found a background. We see a little bit of a background from air showers, but they appear to be uh, resolved, or have some width on the sky and evolve over uh, as a streak so you can separate them. You can think about what would be the characteristics of a natural source that could put out nanosecond timescale optical flashes. It would be astrophysically incredible. It would either have to be basically a solar luminosity inside of a foot, the nanosecond light travel mm -hmm. time, or it would be coherent, and either one of those would be a pretty remarkable discovery. Nice it, physics. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, in the optical SETI experiments uh, that are looking for pulses, um, they're much easier to do than radio because there's no equivalent of radio frequency interference. There doesn't seem to be any sort of occasional pulse that you know is a, that um, you wouldn't expect from noise. Uh, it, it's a much easier experiment than radio. I'm not saying that we should move from radio to optical, but. Uh, the one other thing to add is that the, the bugaboo here is the, the radioactivity and the, the air showers and the, the kind of the local phenomena that make these experiments hard for the same reason that high energy physics experiments are hard. So we have to, we can solve those problems. It's not trivial, um, but the astrophysical background appears to be low. Okay. In, in the spectroscopic experiments, the optical, there's, there's no background. These cosmic rays that hit the CCDs, it, it's quite easy to figure out it was a cosmic ray and not ET. It's, so they're nice, clean experiments. Okay. Um, so either Dan or, or anyone who's worked with the, um, with the opticals, we heard Phil this morning I mean, being very exuberant and essentially finding no near-term limits to photonics, right? Do any of you have any reason to uh, disagree with that? We're seeing, we're finally seeing Moore's law in the, in the communication, in the standard domain, approach a limit, although not a brick wall necessarily. But is photonics unlimited? Are we, should we follow Phil's um, uh, suggestions that we think unlimited, think far? in advance. So um, in terms of Moore's law, so the brain is a million times better than anything we have. You know, it's 10 watts, it's a petabyte, it's a petaop per second. So um, there's still lots of room for Moore's law, and maybe there's stuff that's way better than the brain, quantum computers, or something like that. So there's still a lot of Moore's law left in us. Well, in us, yes, but I'm, I'm actually picking yeah. on this one technology, which is, is well, the photonics, yeah. I think it's, it's just too early to tell. I mean, uh, uh, how much would you know about Moore's Law in 1960? Okay. I, I think it's very scalable. I think you can phase up these arrays, you can build it. I think this is something that you pitched long ago, is uh, large N, small d, lots of little telescopes, you know, with small telescopes, and that, that's a very scalable technology that might, you might be able to go you know, well, 10 to the 12 telescopes. Phased arrays are, have been around for a half a century in, yeah. in the microwave, and, yep. uh, but not in the optical. Oh, you think there's fundamental limits to scaling the optical? Well, it's a different, uh, lasers are quantum devices, and microwave millimeter devices are classical devices. They're, they're really, at, 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 at base, different technologies. And they have different features and limitations. Now, in the older microwave millimeter wave, 
That's been worked out very well. That's a really well understood field. And the economies of scale have occurred, and the, uh, uh, the S-curve of development has occurred, and we know it very well. You can now get by a um, uh, microwave d devices at a penny a watt. Mm -hmm. But I don't know of any kind of physical limitations at scaling up the optical. I mean, right now, you can build a oh, the, set the, of telescopes. The physical that limitations in, in laser devices come to things like coherence length. Yeah. And um, efficiency, quantum efficiencies, things like that. that and, and it's early days. We'll see. Um, and I think we'll come back to that because Phil is in the audience and we ought to ask him directly. But let's, let's keep it up here for a little bit longer. Um, Dan, you mentioned, uh, so we've been looking at two ideas for all sky optical. One of them all the time, one of them part of the time. Anyway, we've, we've seen two new ideas there. And you mentioned, and I mentioned when we started this morning, that when we did SETI 2020, we thought that was going to happen in the radio, right? And that our basic limitation was the computational capacity to form all the beams on the sky with simple uh, low-gain receivers and um, a lot of them to get reasonable amounts of collecting area. So uh, what's changed with that? And what, what are these um, paths, right? phased array feeds for single dish telescopes. Um, okay, so Ron could tell us a little more about this, but these are um, things that are about a meter on a side that have hundreds of elements. Uh, and then there's digital signal processing telescope that can phase up these elements to look at many places in the sky simultaneously. And you can tile the ground with these things. I think the big thing that's changed the military's actually had these for a long time. The big thing that's changed is the signal processing that you put after it to form all these beams. It, it takes, you know, peta-ops, but that's, peta-ops are not, are pretty easy to come by these days. And Ron and I were just pricing it out out in the yard there, and you need a half a million dollars to do 400 beams at a gigahertz, something like that. But that, you know, that's, uh, that's uh, affordable now. If you'd asked me 10 years ago, I would have said it's unaffordable. Okay. But, but it's also, uh, petaops is a lot smaller than the 10 to the 21 operations per second that we were looking at back then. So I'm trying to find, if I'm trying to educate myself on what have these phased arrays bought us in terms of some kind of electronic or analog um, computation that means that we don't have to do it all digitally. I don't, Ron? Ron? I, I'm, I don't think it's different from these early days. I, I think that they have now developed the technology that makes very low noise receivers, you know, good transistors. Ron was just telling about the new transistor they're putting in. So the noise temperatures come down. They have more elements. They've figured out how to get all the heat out. There's a lot of technological developments that they have, how to kind of keep the RFI out of the bands. And uh, they've got, but I don't think there's some like, brand new kind of Nobel discovery, uh, but the digital stuff has come way down in cost. I think one other thing to add uh, on the aperture array side is that the cost of the collecting area itself is coming down. So uh, the, the last number I heard was something like $1,000 per square meter for uh, an L-band aperture array. Okay. Ron, I think you're the expert on this stuff. So uh, Dan summarized it pretty well, but since I'm up here anyway, I might make a two introductory remarks which relate to other comments that were going on. Um, there is the difference that radio is working in the classical domain. There are very many photons per state. That means you've used the same uh, photons many times over when you form these beams. So if you break your aperture up into n elements, you straight away have n squared ways to combine them. So that back end goes up much faster than the cost of the actual aperture array itself. And that's where a decade ago, when we were talking about this 15 years ago, uh, Moore's Law, we thought that Moore's Law would get us there. And I think Dan and I would now say it is just getting us there, just now. So that was a huge cost, that, that, that back end. So uh, whereas in the, uh, in the quantum limited domain, you've got, you can only use your photons once, and it's quite a different strategy. 
My other general comment uh, was triggered by what Andrew said, and it may or may not address his, the question. So if somebody is trying to make themselves visible, uh, they're going to have a finite amount of energy available to them, no matter, no matter how intelligent they are. Uh, and how do you distribute that? So if you have some kind of array, optical or radio, make a beam, your energy density is higher, so that's more likely to get above the threshold. But there's a lack of re 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 uh, there's a reciprocity, lack of uh, which, which is interesting. So when we build the radio detector, we can simultaneously have all these beams. That's perfectly allowed. If you're transmitting with the same thing, your you energy is still conserved. You've got to divide your energy between the, all of those beams. So now it's a bad strategy to target everyone at once. It's far better to stick your energy concentrated in space and in time and cycle around your targets. You get above the threshold. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, it's a very much better strategy to be all sky all the time than think they'll be wasting their energy trying to target everybody at once. Okay. So that's why I think this all sky is a domain which we haven't explored. We can do it now. And as Dan said, there's technology which has got these aperture arrays themselves, down in cost, good performance. So we're about ready to do it. And we can also do it at full bandwidth. Well, not. Okay. You could do it at wider bandwidth than you used to be able to. Um, so I actually now want to go back to Andrew Howard's quandary, what you opened with. And I, I, I kind of have a feeling Chris Rose probably didn't get any time to eat lunch because everybody was on him about his factors <laughs> of 10 to the 15. And let's open this up to the audience. And what, um, what did you take away from this morning? What questions do you have? Phil. Hi, I just want to address uh, two comments. One that Andrew Howard made and the other that Dan made. Um, first of all, as to your question, uh, Andrew, as to why one would want to use higher gain, um, the answer is actually a quantitative in that you get a higher signal-to-noise ratio on a given target, even though you may have a smaller beam, because the amount of time for a given signal-to-noise depends on both the signal, which is much higher, and the noise, which is lower when you integrate less. And we cover this in rather uh, gory detail in paper if you're interested in looking at. The other reason that it doesn't make sense to spread your power all over the place is that we think that uh, planets are important and planets are generally associated with stars as far as we can tell except for some outliers. Uh, and therefore the range in which the target is of interest is relatively small in terms of angular scale. Uh, and that favors systems which can take advantage of uh, high angular acuity. So, uh, for example, a kilometer array of the type we're talking about for Starshot has a nanoradian um, field of view and therefore has, you know, 10 to the minus 18 steradians. And so you can actually target um, a, a sub AU at very large distances and you can make much more uh, use of the uh, power that you have. But that's just purely a, a quantitative question. Go ahead. Let me just respond briefly. So I actually agree with you that, that we need high gain for this to work. I guess the, el the essence of my point was if you can't see the target, then you can't take advantage of that high gain to point in that direction. I, I agree with you there, uh, but we do see a lot of stars. So we can start target a lot of stars. There's obviously a targeting issue. And so when I talked to him, when I showed the plot of probability of detection for a blind beacon, which it, what it was, it was a blind beacon. The civilization transmitting has no knowledge of what's out there, and us receiving have no knowledge of where they're transmitting from. It was a purely blind, blind experiment. Um, but it's enhanced by the fact that the civilization transmitting presumably knows where stars are and might assume that civilizations they're receiving are near stars. But so we can debate they, they, that. As they do know within the galaxy for sure. Yes. And for the very nearest galaxies, you can, we can at least find the bright stars. But truly extragalactic so when astronomy, you go, we can't identify the stars, so we can't really identify the targets. And I, and I agree with you there. But uh, again, just uh, looking at quantitatively, the further out you go, 
the smaller the angular distance is between the stars, and hence the more stars you cover with a given beam, and you still win. But maybe we could take that part offline, but I, I, I'm quite convinced that you actually do much better always by having higher gain modulo the issue of sort of uh, you know, efficiency of targeting. It, it might take some time to go from target to target. In other words, to slew on a telescope or to phase shift, but that's a different issue. I want to address Dan's point, and this is a very serious one for me, and I think needs to be really uh, thought about in the community, and that's the question of transmission. I hate to bring it up, but I love to bring it up. Okay, we are transmitting now. Every time you send an email saying, I don't think we should transmit, you are transmitting. Every time we go on our cell phone, every time we answer an email, and, wait a minute, just a second. Um, and I want to bring out one very quantitative point of view that I think we need to put numbers here rather than just saying we shouldn't transmit because we're obviously always transmitting. Uh, the power per unit solid angle for an adaptive optics laser, which those in astronomy, there might be a few here, use, is much higher uh, in terms of power per unit solid angle than is if you ran Arecibo at full power with the planetary radar, mm -hmm. it's just an issue of wavelength. So therefore, I think those who say we should not transmit really need to understand what they're saying. I will give you, you can still use your microwave oven, you can still use your cell phone, <coughs> but we are already using laser calm to space, um, adaptive optics lasers, which have more power peanut area than Arecibo run yeah. with a megawatt. So Phil, I, I agree with you that we're definitely transmitting, but I, I do think there may be something fundamental about people who, who uh, deliberately want to transmit a very powerful, narrow beam signal that is sent anti-cryptographic, that contains a lot of information that they hope that another civilization will decode. That's not the kind of thing that we're doing now. And I think there is some unknown risk to that. Uh, that, and I think there, there is different from sort of leakage off television, which, um, and, and the BMU's radars and things that we leak or don't really contain information. So uh, I'm happy that Frank, when he sent that message from Arecibo, sent it to something 25,000 light years away. Thank you, Frank, for, and I, you know, I've set my alarm clock for 50,000 years from now to see if there, something comes back. Um, but I, I think there's some risk, and I think, I don't know what the risk is, and I think it's very difficult to assess that risk. Uh, and if you're gonna do it, you better have an Asilomar process that, you know, where you bring in all people from all countries in different fields, and you try to assess that risk and what the potential benefits are. I think it's kind of similar to what mm -hmm. people do when they're doing very dangerous work in science with viruses or, you know, DNA rep genetic I, technology, I, I agree, and we should, we should really think carefully. I, I agree with you. I want to comment on all those the questions. Uh, what we're doing now is not transmitting. <laughs> we're leaking. It's leakage radiation. Now, Wally Sullivan showed 35, 40 years ago in detailed analysis that the Earth at that time uh, was not very visible far from the solar system. Remember, all of our cell phones and, and such are uh, not coherent with each other, so they're not transmitting all in a given direction, and they're out of phase. Uh, but the only things that are really potentially visible are, these days, planetary radars, and back in the Cold War, the uh, ABM radars. And even them, uh, even, uh, even they were uh, not very visible very far away, and in a later analysis that John Billingham and I did, we came to a conclusion that it the possible range for anything we really have here is about a light year. And as we all know, there are no stars within a light year. All right. Jeff Scargill. They were oh, they were first. I was sorry, trying to read my notes. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Webb Cash from the University of Colorado. Um, uh, Jill, when you had us raising our hands, um, you should have gone higher in probability. I probably wouldn't have lowered mine till about six nines of certainty that there are uh, other intelligent civilizations out there. On the other hand, I'm, if you had asked what's our probability of success, I would have dropped out very early. Uh, and, and that's, well, okay, there was another great science fiction movie 60 years ago in which the 
Krell destroyed themselves in their search for freedom from material need. Uh, in some sense, do we evolve to become a post-technical civilization? And my question in it to the panel is, has anybody thought of a way we could find a post-technical civilization? Would it just be, you know, immortal philosophers running around the jungle? Um, I mean, well, is, is there a way to look that might be a little subtler than beams and leakage? Well, astrophysical archaeology. <laughs> well, actually, is Jeff Kuhn, do you want to respond to that? Oh, okay. The point that's interesting, I think, is that there are unintentional signals that we can't really hide, and they're thermodynamic, and they go back analogous to what Freeman Dyson said years ago. Um, it's surprising, but you know that, that the energy that we use now is 10 to the minus 4, the total power that the Earth receives from the sun. The contrast is a civilized part of California rotates around the limb is, is even larger. It's at 10 to the minus 2. So if you had a measurement that could distinguish albedo changes from thermal emission changes, and there are ways of doing that, you could see a civilization just from this, its waste heat. The total power associated with, I mean, life is about energy. And if you go down a couple of notches, we can find life just from basically what is the process of heat production through photosynthesis. So you don't think that technology is going to get to the point where there's essentially no waste on the, the energy? Well, um, may, maybe it does, but if, yeah. if civilization is about information, information, I think, as we learned this morning, has an energy cost to it, and we're orders of magnitude away from that. But ultimately, that's another limit where you can start to look for for heat. How do you distinguish between uh, thermal radiation from a civilization and geophysical, uh, geothermal, from the planet itself? Sure. And the albedo change is an even bigger one. There's a paper out there that, that some of us wrote that, that, that tries to answer that question by looking at multi-wavelengths. So if you're going to use heat and dump your heat, it'll be at temperatures that are close to the temperature of the planet. Most of the geophysical temperature sources are much hotter than that. So temperature is, is one way in. A couple of wavelengths at 5 and 10 microns would do that. And the albedo comes from other, other visible. You can always fool yourself, but the question is, do you have a way of extracting something which is thermodynamic in, in most cases? And I think the answer is potentially yes. Okay. Another, were Jeff, were you next? So I, I don't know how the conversation evolved to where it was a perfect segue to what I was going to talk about, but I'm glad that it has. Um, there's a very provocative paper put out um, a couple weeks ago by David Kipping uh, proposing a way of actively hiding transits of Earth from extraterrestrials, uh, basically focusing on firing lasers at other stars that can see us transiting to mask our signal. And as far as I'm aware, uh, there's not that much out there in the literature that has proposed ways of hiding Earth uh, in ways similar to this. For instance, you can also do this with radial velocity by blurring the sun's spectrum. Uh, and I'm just curious, uh, this is a sort of a, something you might do in addition to minimizing the leakage that we have from other things that are broadcasting our presence. And I wonder if there's any I can think of a number of philosophical reasons to not want to broadcast um, indiscriminately our presence, that we have a habitable world around the sun in case we are afraid of other civilizations that might come and do us harm. So I just wanted to get the panel's opinions on whether this is something that's worth doing further research on to see if we really should be doing this. And if we're not going to broadcast, it seems to me that Maybe it's in our best interest to hide. So I wonder what the panel thinks about that. I just want to make one comment on this um, the specific cloaking proposal in the Kipping paper. So for those who didn't read it, the, the idea is during uh, the times when the Earth would transit the sun uh, from a distant vantage point of some other civilization, we shine lasers at that civilization that have a total power which basically masks the transit signal. And maybe you, sp you spread out a few lasers across to match basically the spectral energy distribution of the sun so that it, it kind of roughly matches. 
So that works if you have a broadband photometer, but as soon as you point a high resolution photometer, you've basically announced that you have a cloaking device and that you don't want to be seen. Right. So it only, it only works for people that are civilizations which are casually looking for us. One thing I just want to say. Or put a giant Fresnel lens and, and take the sun's energy, which perfectly matches, but. Yeah, so I mean, I, I don't think that David's paper was the absolute solution, like the best way of cloaking the Earth. I, I just thought that was sort of a first step, and that in principle, technologically, there could be developments that enable you to do more effective cloaking. And I just uh, wondered if maybe that's a worthy thing, or a reasonable thing to be doing. I, I would comment that uh, the website that Paul Gilster here runs, Centauri Dreams, has had extensive coverage of that paper and a very extensive set of comments most of them informed, uh, that uh, discuss this widely, and I would recommend anybody interested in tunneling into it uh, to go look at Centauri Dreams. Actually, personally, I liked the inverse that was also mentioned in the paper, which is that during transit, you could use your lasers to announce your presence. I, I, I think it's a slippery slope. Like, are you going to remove oxygen from our atmosphere? You know, because that, that betrays the presence of photosynthesis. I, I don't know where you'd stop along there. I mean, they had a biocloak in the paper, right? That was, that was one of the other things that was proposed, that you don't actually remove the oxygen, you just hide its presence. Right. You transmit the, in those lines. Anyway, thank okay. you. Jeff Scargo. Um, I, I think everybody knows that if you put an astronomer in a room with a large amount of random data, eventually something interesting will turn up. Um, in, in this case, we have noisy data. We have random errors. We have systematic uh, effects like dispersion. We have astrophysical background. We don't know what the signal that we're looking for is, so we don't know, you know when to stop in some sense. And uh, someone mentioned intermittency is a problem. We can't guarantee that we can check by waiting for a repeat. So obviously there are very hard problems with detection. And we've heard a lot of ideas about ways of getting new and different data. But I, I, I guess what I want to ask is, what's the status of information technology in this area? And what new developments are needed for the, the statistical and data analysis problems that all of these methods will be facing? Maybe I can speak to that a little bit. I, you know, certainly from a, a breakthrough listen perspective, um, modern data analytics, machine learning, um, neural networks, these are things that are very exciting to us. Oh, good. Well, I think um, there hasn't minutes. been a, as much kind of penetration into astronomy as there could be by these things. So certainly the Palomar transient factory and the, the VFaster experiment with, with VLBA have used it to some degree. But I think we have a lot of, a lot of work to do there. And that's certainly something that we're, we're very excited to work with the, the Silicon Valley community on. Yeah, I, I hear the phrase machine learning tossed around a lot without too much specifics, but uh, I, I think that's the right direction. In some yeah, well, sense, I, you know, the, the problem, at least from a, in, in radio SETI, is interference mitigation and, and telling the difference between our own terrestrial technology and, a, and an extraterrestrial technology. And we think that, that machine learning based classification of, of interference sources that we identify in our data could be a, a very useful way of, of, of dealing with that. So I think that's, that's kind of the low hanging fruit uh, from, a, from a SETI perspective. And I think identifying astrophysical transients is, a, is another very good one, uh, which is, is basically what Palomar Transient Factory is doing in the optical, but we're only just barely starting to do in the radio. But I think, you know, in the next sort of five or 10 years, with you know, what we're doing with Breakthrough Listen and also with next generation radio telescopes like the Square Kilometer Array, we're gonna hear a lot more about this. I, I would add to that that um, in the Pulsar business uh, for the last 10 to 15 years, we've been saving all the raw data. So this is mm -hmm. like 64 microsecond resolution, maybe about a thousand channels. Mm -hmm. And you know, so a in aggregate, we have about a petabyte of data. And, the data have been subjected to you know, more than a half dozen reprocessings because the algorithms improve. So I think it's really important to save as much data as possible. Yeah. And in, in I, I'm, I'm a little uh, wary of the real t fully real-time uh, analysis where you throw away yeah. the bulk of the data. Yeah. And save I, it in a way that's easy to access in a coherent way with 
guidelines as to yeah. what the data yeah. means and not just put it on the web somewhere. But in SETI at home, exactly. we, we have about a petabyte, and we keep thinking of new ideas. Every year, we reprocess it and look for some new kind of signal. OK, thanks. Uh, this is for uh, web cache. Uh, maybe we should discuss a wager. Your five nines present what I think might be very attractive odds for a curmudgeon skeptic on uh, extraterrestrial intelligence like me. So if you're willing to even grant a fraction of those odds, maybe we can do long bets or one of those things. I'll put up 100, and you put up 10 to the 5 times 100. Or whatever. Anyway, so um, I wanted to just say one other curmudgeonly thing, which is when's it going to stop? I mean, I'm all in favor of heretical searches like these missions to check for violations of Lorentz invariance and to beat down these numbers closer and closer to zero, which pretty much everyone expects are zero, but they're waiting that like maybe they aren't zero, you know, maybe there's a violation of Lorentz invariance or maybe there's one of these other things, but it looks like we might be in danger of having that happening in SETI too, you know, the, the there's no Dyson spheres now in our galaxy, right? I thought that's been determined with infrared astronomy. And, you know, pretty soon, according to um, Phil, there's, we'll know if there's any powerful lasers pointed at us from any one of the 10 to the 15th planets or whatever it is. It seems like you, the SETI community might be getting backed into a corner where they just have to keep coming up with reasons why it's harder and harder to imagine detecting the needle in the haystack, even though we're actually quite capable of detecting needles in many kinds of haystacks now. What do you think about that? Well, I, I, I'll offer one perspective, and that is that, in my opinion, the search for advanced life beyond Earth should never stop. It is such a fundamental question. As long as we have an idea and the capacity to conduct a search, we should do it. OK, Paul, were you before Lisa? Um, so one of the questions that I had, and this is coming from the point of uh, looking for signatures uh, in the atmosphere of planets and then looking for the signatures of life, and the point was a little bit raised already. Uh, if you had a look at the Earth from far away with telescopes, you could tell with the capability we're going to have in five to ten years that there was life for about two billion years with the combination of oxygen and methane, and we can discuss about how solid that is. But I would like to know how that actually influences the discussion, because sometimes I see a little bit of a disconnect that this presence of photosynthesis, as was pointed out, is something that would be very easy to find. And so we're discussing about a message that would actually show high intelligence, right? Not just that there's life, because that's easily to discern otherwise uh, with normal telescope. Is this something that actually is starting to shape the discussion in the SETI community because we're getting the capabilities to do spectroscopical measurements of planetary atmospheres, and how mm. is it is influencing it? I was, that's in a way also connected to the next session we have it. I don't know if who wants to take that. Well, I mean, in a gross sense, if we found more and more Earth-like uh, characteristics of nearby planets, all of those searches that are targeting I think would prioritize that, uh, those, those directions. Anybody else want to take? I think the, the question was a bit more also about uh, this discussion about should we, uh, should we send you know, signals or not, because in a way we are sending the signals that there's life without us doing anything actively. I, I don't know if that comes in, because I, the cloaking well, device I, I is not going to work. We shouldn't send signals deliberately to this civilization without a proper discussion and a due respect for the opinions of mankind. And womankind. I was quoting Jefferson. That's the way he said it. He had his problems, too. <laughs> I know. That's what I meant. All right. Paul, yeah. Um, I just wanted to throw a little cold water on one, one thing that bubbled up earlier, which is that the idea of targeting individual stars, at least in nearby galaxies, you know, the Magellanic Cloud or Andromeda or something like that. Um, so it's certainly true that when you can see stars, you know where the light's coming from. And so if the problem is detection, you know exactly where to point. If you're going to transmit, you have you to lead the when. bird because the thing has proper motion. And you could say, well, you know, I can see the proper motion. I can resolve the thing so I know where to aim. No, you don't because you need to know the range. And just to give you a number, it's actually in, this, in the Andrew Howard paper, um, if you want to target a star with a beam 
that's compact enough, let's say, to illuminate 10 AU. And if the star has a proper motion of 10 kilometers per second, assuming you could even measure that, you have to know the range to within five light years. So try doing that at a few megaparsecs. So I think this problem is much more difficult than people give you credit for. Now, maybe the, maybe the way to escape this is just say, well, we won't make a beam that's a nano radian with our huge array that is idle in between doing starship launches. Um, we'll make a big fat beam and you can't miss. Well, that's true, but then you've sort of lost the whole point of optical city. That's my point. Okay. Am I right? <laughs> Sounds good. Well, Phil's up on his feet, so it sounds like it. maybe he has some comments on that. Now, Phil Lubin, who, who stood up when Paul spoke, he's liking, he's wanting to defend himself. All right. Uh, we actually only have another five minutes, so. I had a comment on when one stops looking, and this is not quite when one stops looking, but when the value goes down. Right now, SETI is broadening its parameter space in a somewhat exponential way. And if we're starting, as long as we're doing that, I think the value for each exponential factor, e-folding, is comparable. Whereas if, we're start, if we look at most of what we can conceivably look at, if we're looking at the last 10% of the stars, the more difficult 10%, mm. then the marginal value of it goes down substantially compared to what we're getting nowadays. Okay. Bill, you had a comment? Yeah, so um, I, I can't help but note the irony in this discussion about the messaging or the broadcasting because um, it occurs to me um, that if, if we want to make, if it's a fair statement to make that the concerns about actively broadcasting our presence would be perhaps not an intelligent thing to do, at least at this point in time. I'm curious because if we discover something, presumably we're going to discover something that was sent by a civilization that has had that debate and passed that debate because right now we can't detect leakage and anything we're talking about detecting, whether it be optical or radio, is going to be powerful enough that those having transmitted it will have done so knowing that they are belying their presence. So it just seems sort of ironic that in the entire world of SETI, we're looking for beings doing something that at least some of us feel we shouldn't do. Well, so I just think I, that's a I, bit My, my argument is that um, there could be very advanced civilizations that figure this out and they know whether it's good to transmit or not. But we are just a primitive civilization. We're still killing each other. You know, just a blink of an eye, humans have been here. And for, we don't really know what the dangers are. But I, I'm not saying we shouldn't transmit forever, but I just think right now we're at the extremely early stages so we just, it's impossible to assess these risks and we should just be listening at first. But I'm not saying in a thousand or a million years we shouldn't transmit when we learn a little bit about the universe, but right now we know nothing. Sure. Well, and I will say in defense of, of that perspective, it is possible that even if we detect something, they've already been eaten by the time we detect it. So <laughs> that's also Because they possible. transmitted. <laughs> Phil, do you want to respond to yeah, Paul, to, and then we have to wrap this up? Point. At, Paul, great. We, we still got to do our comedy act, okay? So remember, that's, that's on the agenda. Uh, Paul and I have an interesting sense of humor. Um, so at, at uh, a few megaparsecs, let's say, the you know, distance to the nearest uh, significant galaxies, the uh, spot size from the system we're talking about building for Starshot would have uh, of, of order a few hundred AU of, uh, of divergence by the time it gets there. So I, I actually don't disagree with your comment um, at all. In fact, in the paper we talk about the issue of having to know proper motion well enough in our own galaxy. But in our own galaxy, it still actually brings up the probability quite a bit to be able to target the stars. But I, I, don't, I don't disagree, so I think we're you know, on the same page here. Uh, the other point, Dan, is I, I really want the community to talk about this quantitatively, not just in, in emotions. We already transmit with adaptive optics to stars and you know, exoplanets that we're looking at with telescopes, much more power per unit solid angle than Arecibo would if it pointed at the same target and turned on a megawatt transmitter. So I think a useful metric to adopt is to say, let's keep the power per unit solid angle below the existing uh, adaptive optics and laser comm 
And then I don't think there'll be any disagreement. But if we just what have a blanket the statement. Do you want to also keep the content to no, no messages with any content? But LaserCom but, has messages with content. We are they're already. They're all encrypted, right? Uh, no, yeah. Okay, but they're wait. They're deliberately I mean, encrypted. Oh, okay. This but is the other, the other way. I think people want to send anti cryptographic, which I think is a little different. I just want to add one, one thing to this comment about yeah. our use of, of you know, high power communication systems and, and radar and, and laser on this planet. We do absolutely do that, and those signals you know, leak out into space. But as, as humanity, we receive a very concrete benefit from those activities. We do those things for, for a reason. We do it to find asteroids and to you know, explore the universe. And so if we're going to talk about, about transmitting, we should talk about what benefit exactly we're, we're hoping to gain from that. Yeah, I, I, complete, I think it's a risk versus benefit analysis. And I don't think that we, we know enough to really assess that. But at least, at least we need to think, think it through it very carefully. And, and I don't think we can do it I don't think it has to, it can't be done just in the astronomy community. It has to be politicians and economists and anthropologists. And, and I think we need a, a much wider perspective than just, uh, and I don't think it should be one person who thinks that they want to send a message should be able to do that. I think that okay. this question of who should speak for Earth is, is a, it's a big kind of fundamental question. And, and, well, and this it, is one of a number of different existential questions that we face today. And there are f people who are looking for ways forward to, to work through these questions. I've been intrigued for a number of years now on how we can use technology to have a global conversation on this topic and include people at the table with traditions and cultures that have never uh, participated. I've just recently, if anybody knows, uh, or has had an experience with using liquid freedom I would love to, to talk with you about it because there's a claim that this is a very democratizing piece of um, application that can be used to have these kinds of conversations and not get spammed and not get dominated by the loudest voice and actually come to some consensus. And Svetlana, I, we are actually out of time and I just have to say I've, I've enjoyed this tremendously and I hope that we see more of it in the next uh, day and a half. Um, I also say that in this next day and a half, I'd really like to hear some discussion while Chris Rose is with us of what if a piece of that starship um, was intended to do the kind of message sending that he is suggesting, and as we fly by, it gets dropped off. What, what opportunities are there for that? Because I haven't heard any kind of interchange on that. Anyway, thanks to the panel. Thank you to the audience. Uh, and I think we are done. <laughs>